Good morning, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was very strengthened and challenged in my Christian life to sit here and to hear your beautiful singing and the teaching of the Sunday school. I really don't think you got finished with the Sunday school. Maybe I should just sit down and have the teacher come back up here and you ought to finish that thing, clinch that thing. But I know it's a, a discussion that is very, very difficult to know exactly what Jesus Christ was saying. I'm excited, I'm thrilled to be here again this morning, uh, mainly because uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is here. His Holy Spirit is here with us. God dwells among his people. And as I said one other time, those of us who are in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ love to be with the people that we love the most. And to us, that's God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I counted a big privilege, uh, my wife and I, the loveliest, to be here because you're here. You're a very important group of people. You're God's children. We are a struggling people. This is, uh, how do I say the name of this church? Osceola? Osceola Christian or Christian Hospital. And so we are here to study the Word of God. We're here to get our our toes stamped on a little bit, at least I try to do that, to do that myself, and we're, we're here to find power, we're here to find grace, amen? We're, we're a broken, bleeding, bruised people, we've been through the mill, we have issues in our life, we're not at the top rung of the ladder, we're at the bottom rung of the ladder, we have issues, we have pain, we would have reasons to make excuses, uh, we're just a needy people. Maybe that's not a nice thing for a guest speaker to say, but we just all have needs. And I think the greatest need, or the, the second greatest thing a person can do is to, is to sense their need of Jesus Christ, to be in Jesus Christ in a more fully sense. Uh, the greatest thing, the greatest thing that a person can do is to have that need met, to, to humble ourselves and to have that need met. So this morning... The subject that we're going to be discussing, we're, we're all going to have needs. There's nobody here in perfection, but we all have needs. And as we look into the beautiful, moving, dynamic Word of God, uh, we're going to see needs, and we're going to have those needs met in Jesus Christ. I also want to thank you one more time. Before I get to preaching, I'll do this very, very quickly for the warmth of your reception of Janet and I. We had a very, very good weekend so far. We just love Corey and Dolores. We, we felt like we just didn't really connect yet. And you know, we live there in the cabin. We don't see a lot of them. They don't see a lot of us. And uh, we just really appreciate their family and their cabin and, and all the rest of you, the homes that we've gotten into. We love you people. And maybe we can sit down and talk a little bit yet more, Corey and Dolores. Also to the folks that are sitting close to Carl and Darla back there, I understood that Friday night he said that he was up every hour of the night because he was making, uh, what do you call that meat? I'm not a cook. He was making, uh, for, he was making brisket up every night, and so he was tired. It didn't go real well for him. He thought it got too dry. I thought it's delicious. So you guys sitting around Carl there, if he nods off for Pete's sake, let him nod, let him get a little bit of sleep. I'm going to try and keep him awake. Don't jam him, don't elbow him. He is shot, he's tired, he, he's a mess, but he's going to survive. <laughs> he's going to survive. Okay, having said all that, gutting, having, having gotten that off my nerves, and my, I don't know that I have a lot of nerves, but having got that off my mind, I can proceed with uh, the very beautiful message that we have here this morning. And I don't know, I'm, I'm going to call it, what is the atmosphere of your home? I, I want to speak about the Christian home here this morning. I was really wrestling with God a little bit like Jacob did. And I took into account what could be some of your needs here. And when you get really, really close to God, because God doesn't yell, God's not a yeller, he just whispers. And the closer we get to God, you know, we hear those whisperings. And I just felt with all the children and the young families and the youth that you have, uh, even for grandparents, we, we just can't go wrong by having a message on 
the Christian home the way God intended it to be. And I know here this morning, I'm smart enough to know, I'm probably, hopefully, a little smarter than I look, (laughs) that there are some of us here this morning that are not married, and I, I realize... I realize the the beauty, the importance, you know, the wonderfulness of singlehood. And so if you're here this morning, we're not trying to delete you. God has called you to a very high calling also. And it doesn't matter who you are here this morning. If you're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, God God has a mission for you. And so don't feel left out by this particular message here this morning. So I do kindly invite your attention to Psalm. We're going to go back to the book of Psalms. Psalms that God called uh, David, a man who was after his own heart. He was the great singer of Israel. David was. And in Psalm 127, he tells us some very, very beautiful things, some very important things concerning the Christian home. So before we get to that, though, I I would like to talk a little bit about Christian home atmosphere, and what I would like for you not to do, listen, what I would like for you not to do is sit there and imagine someone else's home life, because you're a congregation, you all know one another very, very well, right? And it's our propensity to scrutinize and put on the binoculars and look over here and say, I think he's he's addressing that home, Uh, he probably has these people over here in mind, no, I do not, because I don't know you. Everything I said so far... This weekend of revival meetings, I know all but zero of, uh, of your situations here, so I'm very, very free. Thank God I'm very, very free in that area. Uh, so just, just take a look at your own self, your own fatherhood, your own motherhood, or if you're children, take a look at your degree of loyalty and obedience in the home and what you are doing in order to beautify the home that God placed you in. I just want you to zero in on yourself. So, when we talk about the atmosphere of the home, what, what is your home life like? Is it, a, is it a beautiful place to be? And so, I guess the, the home, the home atmosphere of every one of the homes that are here this morning can be no more beautiful than what the father of the home is beautiful, and, what, and the atmosphere, the things, the tone, the tenor, and the singing or whatever in the home can never out-magnify the, the beauty of a godly woman, a godly wife, and a godly mother. She's three things, so is the husband. He's a man before God. He's a married husband, and he's a father of children. If you have children, not all couples have children. So there again, don't feel like, you know, I'm maximizing on that. I understand the pain of not having children when you're married. But I, I just want you to decide on a scale between 1 and 10, what is the quality of your home? I want you to think it through. Get it good. Now let me say this, lest I forget. And that is according to biblical theology, we will discover over and over many times in God's Word that the first, the most important, the, uh, the etymology of, of all institutions was the home. Before God created the church and the school, He created the what? He created the home. So out of the home comes the church. And out of the home and the church come the quality of the school, the dynamics of the community, and even the whole society. And we see that's why in this great United States of America, our society has become open rivers of sewage from the gates of hell because men and women have walked away from the responsibility uh, of knowing and loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have divorce and we have abortion and woke and all these other things that are destroying the great homes in the United States. And so we have school shootings. You know, we took prayer out of school and we brought in all kinds of uh, sex values and many other things if you studied all this. And, and the horrifics of abortion, somebody said that the most dangerous place for a child to be is in the womb of his mother. This is the situation of the United States of America because we have redundantly, repeatedly, on purpose, removed God from the conscience of our society. And so we're in a huge mess that I don't know if it's claimable. It seems like an irrevocable mess of sewage and separation from what heaven wants the home to be. But that's them. That's not you. That's outside. 
Those things that happen in divorce and everything in the homes outside should never be happening in the inside of the church. But you know, sometimes it is. And a congregation of this size, I'm going to be stupid enough, stupid enough to believe that there could be a marriage or a home that's struggling. And sometimes we struggle over things that God did not intend us to struggle in because He gave us every glory. He gave us the powers of heaven in order to live successful personal Christian lives and to develop homes that are heaven on earth. And so why do we struggle in areas that we should not be struggling? I can believe that we struggle against the temptations of the devil. And we have a lot of struggles and temptations in our life that are not intrinsic with us. But sometimes, as young people, as homes and fathers and mothers in the home, we struggle over issues. We battle against things that we shouldn't be a part of that war. Eh? Come on. But we do. So now we're getting back to Christian home atmosphere, having explain that so you know what I mean. What, what is the atmosphere of your home? Is it a happy place? Is it, is it a good place to be? Or is it a place of contention? Is it a place of quarrel? Is it a place of friction where we just exist together and we don't get divorced because we are Anabaptists and Anabaptists don't do something like that, but inside the confines of the walls of our home we really are emotionally and passionately and even sexually divorced. Could there be a divorced home here this morning? Well, I don't mean that you went to the justice of the peace and got a divorce. Good night, no. No, we wouldn't do that. But we fight and we argue and we can't forgive. We end up in bitterness and nobody wants to bury that hatchet, and it just keeps coming up. And we go through life being the devil's fool when heaven is full of mercy and grace, and the Bible is full of all kinds of direction on how we ought to be men and women of the Lord Jesus Christ, how we can be God that love romantic partners in our marriage experience. It's all here. Heaven is full. It's bulging. It's bursting with energy and information and love in order for us to experience the love that Christ had for the church. Why do we lollygag? Why do we question God? Why do we fight battles God never intended us to battle in? Did I make that clear? I can go on to the next point. Okay, Psalm 127, please, one time. Psalm 127. David here is making a parallel between a man and a strong city and so on and the functions of a Christian home, the atmosphere of a Christian home. Except the man build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in, go ahead, vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. This is if you're a watchman, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. We can battle through life. And we can overcome obstacles and try to move mountains. Did you hear about moving mountains lately? <laughs> you know, we can do all those things. And if the Lord is not in it, it's vain. Now verse 3. Lo, children are a what? They're a heritage of the Lord. That means they come from God. God gives them to us for a very, very short little time. And I know those of you who have a large family, you have eight children from two to 14 or whatever, you think, you think that workload's going to last forever. Click your fingers three times, three shakes of a lamb's tail, they're out of the nest, and they're married, and they're gone. And you don't believe that, that's okay, we didn't either. But verse 3, Children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows, get this, verse 4, as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, that's a military man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies at the gate. Happy home life. Joyful home life. Romantic home life. When you're away from home, when I'm away from home, I don't like to be away from home. Whenever I'm away from home, my mind 
It's like that old mule out there in the field at 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock. You know, where does that mule want to go when he's out there pulling that cultivator all day long? Young ladies, where does that mule want to go? Back to the barn. He wants to go back home. And so here, David here is drawing a little bit of picture, a little bit of a picture of what it's like when the home is what it should be. Talking of atmosphere, you know, you think of outside atmosphere. I guess there are three things that, that create atmosphere, right? Those three things that create atmosphere are what? Temperature, humidity, and air pressure, something like that. Where's our science teacher? We're Justin, you teach science. Yep, yep, yep. Is, am I about halfway right there? You know, we have atmosphere outside, right? There's weather outside. Okay, so there's weather. And so there, there are things that decide weather is pleasant and nice and beautiful like it was the last, like yesterday one time. Did you like yesterday? Hands up. I want to make sure you're awake. Come on, wiggle your big toe inside your shoe. Yes, you're awake. That was nice. So there are three things that created yesterday. Eh? Some elements. And so sometimes, I understand, you'll have storms and tornadoes. I think I saw a, th a few storm shelters. And so when it's stormy, you know, there again, it's those three things that decide whether it's going to give a hurricane or a tornado or whatever. And that's the same thing. It's temperature, humidity, and pressure, something like that. And that's how it is in the home, where there's commitment, where there's affection, where there's romance. And you say, come on, I married 30 years, and you're talking about romance? Yes, I am. You heard the word right. Can I say it again? Romance. Now, my wife and I, the loveliest and I, are going to be married 46 years. <laughs> that's longer than what a lot of you people, that's longer than most of you are old. And there's people here are married longer than I. John, real quick, catch you off guard. How long are you married? Wow, 51 years. Romance? Sure, yeah, there's romance. Romance is that, that feeling of passion and, and that love, that, that wanting to be together, that wanting to go home, get home. I want to be at home. I want to see my wife. I want to laugh with her. I want to dine with her. I just want to be close to my wife. I love it. I want to be home. I want to see my kids. I want to get close to them. I want to get down on the floor, and I want to roll around on the floor and be a donkey, and I want to look at that, bring those John Deere's I'd bring... Get them nice toys. Get them Massey Ferguson. Forget the green John Deere's. Get down there and say to your little boy, bring out those Massey Ferguson's. Do you know what, that, what, do you know what a Massey Ferguson is? They're the best, aren't they? Nope, they don't agree. Get down there on that floor and play Dolly. And I don't know how to play Dolly. We had five boys. And then nine years later, we had a little girl. But she played with all the boys' old worn-out toys. And she hardly knew how to play Dolly. But, you know, just spending time with our children, you know, it, it creates... It, there's a love there. There's a passion. There's the oneness. It's called home. It's where people want to be. And so the setting, the pressure, and the humidity is there. The romance, the submission, it creates an atmosphere of peace and joy and serenity. When we go to work, sometimes you sort of get beat up. When we go out into this sleazy unclean, unfit society. We go shopping and there's all kinds of sludge and sleaze dripping from every place when we go into society. When we get back into our homes, I almost feel like i got to step in the shower, turn on the shower and the soap and the suds and, and get all this sleaze and hatred and animosity off of my body so I'm fit to, you know, see my lovely wife or whatever. You know, it, there's so much out there. We, you know, we get beat up and and then, you know, we come back home and there's peace and it's just where you want to be. There's a nurturing and there's a, an uplifting spirit there. You can't wait to feel those feelings. Come on. Is that your home? So now David here, at least I think David wrote this psalm, did he? Let me think... Uh, a Song of Degrees for Solomon. Did David write it? I'm not sure. But here in verse 1 and 2, let me explain something. In verse 1 and 2, he's making a parallel. Except the Lord build the house. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ builds that marriage, and unless his image and his spirit is impregnated in the life of a father and mother, they labor in vain in that marriage that try to do that marriage, create that home, unless the Lord keep the city, unless the Lord is in those relationships, in those attempts, the watchman waketh but in vain. 
And then children are an heritage of the Lord. I think David draws a very, very beautiful picture of what the home would be. So what, what is your home? What, how would you, if you would describe your home here this morning accurately, not what you think it is, not what you propose it should be, but exactly what it is. How would you, how would you go, how would you define the qualities and the characteristics of your marriage and of your home and your relationship with your children and your teenagers? How, how would you do this? How would yours look? Home should be a castle of love, a castle of affection, a place of romance where love flows from one to the other, where it's seen, where it's felt and experienced. Home is also a classroom of teaching and instruction. You know, we teach those children little by little. We have family worship. And so we line up those little children on that sofa there, and we get out the Bible, we get out Bible stories, and we just teach those children. It doesn't have to be 35 minutes long. You don't have to preach a 45-minute sermon. But our home should be a place of family worship. It's where we create the most important thing that we do every 24 hours, and that is we establish the family altar. And it's where you get those rural boys, and you tell those boys about girls, and how they work, and how they function, and how they body, their bodies work. So that we, and you do this, it, it, the, the, these things should happen decently and discreetly in the home. And I've got to be very discreet here this morning. I understand that. But it's a place where we teach our children about God. It's where we teach our children to love and respect their mother. It's a place where we teach our children to never have the intestinal fortitude to say no when we give a command. If you tell your son, Johnny, run out the garbage, no. It's a place where we teach them they don't talk that way to you and they don't treat their mother that way. They treat their mother like a queen because she is their queen. We teach respect and we teach them about the opposite sex. And I remember teaching, training our boys, you know, in, a, in the proper way about courtship standards. And they were 12 years old. And I felt different times I almost got to bring in the bucket because when you start teaching a 12-year-old boy how to be decent and respect people of the opposite sex, they almost vomit. They wouldn't teach a girl, they wouldn't touch a girl with a 10-foot a pole because they would fear permanent contamination. But, you know, we don't wait until they're 18 to take them back out behind the barn and teach them about the birds and bees. That's not the time to do it. Because, you know, they shouldn't learn about these things. They shouldn't learn about God. They should not need to have to learn about God in Sunday school or in the school. They shouldn't learn about the birds and bees out back at a neighborhood sale with the neighborhood boys or by junkie magazines. We don't have that type of trash anymore. That's not the place where our children need to be learning about the facts of God, the facts of life, and the facts of holiness. That's for us fathers to do. We need to do it. It's an honor. It's a privilege because our children, listen, we got to get this and we got to get it good. Our children are the only thing that we can take along to heaven. And sometimes we spend all our energy, all our emphasis, all our time at work, and we come home drained beat down and run out and we say, well, you know, I, I just don't have time for family worship. That's a lie. Sorry. And so if you're here this morning and you think, hey, I don't have time as a father for personal devotions. I don't have time for family worship. That's not the truth. Because every one of us has 24 hours every single day. And we have the time to follow the passions of our body. We, 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 have, we take the time to do the things, accomplish the things that are important to us, right? All right, so eating is very important to me. Because when I turn sideways like this, you see something that shouldn't be there. I mean, I like to eat. And, you know, we, you know, we say we can gain weight. I mean, so, so I eat. Because eating is important to me. And so if, my, if loving my wife and pleasuring my wife and understanding my wife is important to me, I'm going to get it done. And if teaching and training my children is important to me, the next generation is so important to us. The youth that are sitting up, here, sitting up here this morning, they are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. Right now, us old preachers, we're getting old. 
Yes, Corey, you're looking older every time I look at you. That's a lie. Sorry, I shouldn't be lying on the pulpit. But you know, us guys, young men, I said it the other night, we're, we're going we're gonna to get old and wear out, eh? So you guys, I mean, you're, you're the church of today. You're going to be preaching tomorrow. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, don't laugh too hard. I did too when I was 16. I understand. I'm talking about home atmosphere. A castle of passion. A castle of loyalty. A, a castle of giving compliments where we lift one another up. This is what home should be. It's also a courthouse of discernment and punishments. You know, sometimes we need to discern. Sometimes we need to punish our children. And I want to say this, and you're not going to like me, but remember, I didn't come to be liked. We're getting away from this thing of good child spanking. We, we, we're getting away from that. And so we holler at them, and we raise our voice, not Johnny or Sarah. This is the fourth time I'm telling you to do it. Save yourself all that. Save yourself. Children need to be loved. We need to play with them. Lift them up as though they feel they're the, they're the most important thing in your life because they are outside of God. But we got to spank. We're getting away from good, kind, controlled spanking because the the, the world calls it beating. You're beating your kids. You're beating your kids. Well, we don't beat our kids, but we spank them. They say it's abuse. It's not abuse. It's abuse not to discipline them. It's, it's abuse not to spank them. This is how we discourage them. Colossians says, Fathers, don't discourage your children when we neglect them, when we don't train them, when we don't explain, when we don't discipline them, we abuse them. But the world says the opposite. Don't believe them. They don't understand God's Word. They shouldn't be telling us how to do church. They're, they're out there following their own flesh. They shouldn't be writing the criteria for families of heaven, kingdom families. Fathers, come on, get a grip, get it good. Step up, be a dad, love God, love your wife with passion and tenderness and love your children and play with your children and also spank them. Now, that didn't make me very popular. That's all right. And so home... is a courtroom sometimes of discernment and discipline. Proper biblical discipline. It's also a hospital where we heal, we hurt, we confess sins, daddies, we make mistakes. Mothers, you do too, that's okay. If you don't make a mistake, if you don't say something a little bit crosswise or make any mistake, then you're, you're probably not doing anything else or you're probably never at home. When we're at home with our wives and we love them and we're teaching and training out with children, we are going to make mistakes. That's not a bad thing. The big thing about that is what are we going to do about it? I don't know how many times we had our five sons and then Tosh was like nine years on behind and we loved our youth. We, we just loved youth in our house. It just went so fast. You know, when they turned 14, 16, I... <laughs> it's so fun. And older men, don't you ever dare say to younger men in this audience, just you wait till you have teenagers. Never say that. Encourage them. <sighs> okay. Let me get off that pedestal. <laughs> so, we love. And in our loving... We make mistakes. And I don't know how many times, Janet, maybe you can tell me, where's Janet? Do you want to sit up and sing a song here, Janet? Yep, she's sitting back there grinning. She knows what I'm going to say. I think she probably heard me preach this before. I don't preach this sermon every time I go in for revival meetings, but I felt too this morning. How many times in loving my sons and training my sons after a little skirmish came along? That's okay. You're going to have skirmish. Get over it. There's nobody here perfect. If you're a perfect husband and father, wife or mother, raise your hand. I want to see the great perfectionists. I don't see any. Okay, so we make mistakes. That's all right. How many times did I have to go up and knock on my son's door? Michael, hey Brent, can I talk? 
Oh, sure, Dad. And I had to, I had to apologize. And I said, hey, do you know what? Maybe what, what I said was right. But I, the way I said it was wrong. Can you forgive me? How many times? And you know, when I talk to my boys now, they're older and married. They got teenagers. On, they all almost have teenagers themselves. And they say, Dad, you know, the, the biggest thing, or a very, very big thing in you raising us is when, when you made a mistake, you would come and you would humbly say, I'm sorry, I goofed. Can you forgive me? We're, we're going to... Maybe that's why sometimes us husbands and wives are dysfunctional. Maybe in our pride, we're afraid we're going to make a mistake, so then we do neglect, then we do nothing. Hey, do you make mistakes at work? When you learn to do things, what do you do? When you split a two-by-four with a nail gun, you put another one in, I guess. I can't put a 16 penny. Th- I'm not a carpenter. I couldn't build. You wouldn't want me. I wouldn't do well here in Texas. I don't know how to build sheds. Uh, but, you know, we make mistakes. When we make a mistake, what do we do? We fix it. That's okay. Make mistakes. Just go do it. I mean, we don't make mistakes deliberately. You, you understand what I'm saying. All right, well, so home is also a place where we grow, where we develop and mature, and where we nurture one another. It's a place of privacy. It's a place of protection. It's a place of security. It's a place where we let our hair down and burp, and didn't, we don't have to be too ashamed. It's just it's a place where we come out of the world, the workplace, even where we come home from church, and it's just us. It's just an atmosphere of understanding. We create an atmosphere of forgiveness, and we, 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 we can see and smell the vibrations of one another's faults, and we're okay with it because we're not a perfect people, but we still love one another in Christ. It's just a place where we want to be. Is this your home? Am I being idealistic? I don't think so. God would not give us requirements that he knows that we could not execute, does he? Did you understand what I said? Okay, and I won't repeat it. Home. A place of privacy. It's a place where we... It's a place that we remember. A place that we remember. You know, we can go all over the world and we can talk to older people. We can talk to prodigal young people. We can go into jails and prisons and convalescent homes and everybody remembers home. There's something magnetic about home. There's something great to us. It's part of our identity. We, we just, you know, we, we think about home and there's just a, a, there's just a magnetism about home. It's just a place where we all want to be. And it's good at the time, and good food, and brisket, and everything else, good coffee, lovely cabin, lovely friends that we had here in Texas. You know, tomorrow morning, do you know where Janet and I want to go? Can you tell me? Home. Home. Let me say this. My dad and my mother... We're extremely godly people. If I resist and rebel the teachings of my father and mother, I'm going to open up my eyes in the hottest place of hell. But my dad, and I'm number 13, and then I'm the youngest. And then when I was little, my mother did foster care. And the world says, that wears a woman out, that's abusive. Well, you know what? She was about 100 when she died and read the Bible through I don't know how many times and helped raise, you know, the, all her children, godly people and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. She didn't wear out. Well, she wore out not because of her proximity to children and creating a godly home. It's like heaven on earth. We come home to shower. We, we come home to lick our wounds. We come home to get, to get out of the, the batter and the sleaze of the world. We come home.
So I, I invite your attention to Mark chapter 10, please, one time. Go back to Mark chapter 10. I'd like to look at the etymology of the home. The beginning of the home was something very important, and I'm smart enough to know that many of us here this morning, you have committed this to memory. It's in Mark chapter 10. You already know what it is, at least you pastors do. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. And here Jesus talks about the importance. He talks about the, the most important ingredients or characteristics of home and marriage. And I'm going to cut in where? We've got to save some time. Verse 5. Are you in Mark chapter 10, verse 5? And Jesus answered and said unto the Jews that were trying to trap him, Because of the hardness, the evilness, the wickedness of your heart, Moses wrote you this precept, this bill of divorcement. Verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And because of this, for this cause shall a man... What's the next word? Leave. Leave. This is the problem of a lot of marriage issues that my wife sometimes needs to sit up with and deal with when we go out into congregations and there's an invitation given and there's marriage struggles and then we're the ones sometimes that we got to sit up down in the Sunday school room and sort through some marriage till late at night. This is one issue because the man or the wife did not leave father and mother. So this is God. You see, now in your Bible, are those words read? If you have what they call a Cambridge. Now, Cambridge is not a version. It's just a type of the way it's written. Okay, so we could talk about bibliology all morning. We're not going to go there. For this cause shall a man, What? Leave his father and his mother, and he shall what? Cleave. Here's the issue right here. And so if you really want to have, if you want to have a happy, romantic, loving marriage that reminds you of heaven, it makes you want to think, oh, dear wife or dear husband, I can't wait to get to heaven, but there's one thing I don't understand, because in heaven there's neither male nor female, and I guess we'll hopefully at least know each other in heaven, I wouldn't mind spending eternity with you because we're so tight, we're so close, we're one flesh, we're one mind, we're one passion, we're one love, we're one in human sexuality, the way God created it, I'm going to sort of miss you in heaven. But that's a crazy thing to think, eh? Is anybody halfway with me? Okay, good, 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 good. So a man, he's going to have to leave... His father, his mother, he's going to cleave to his wife, and they twain shall become what? One. Just one. Not only in flesh. We pull together. We love together. We cry together. We make mistakes together. And we argue together. But then we confess together. You know, it's not all roses and peaches. Sometimes there's thorns and thistles. That's okay. Thorns and thistles are not bad. What's bad about thorns and thistles, thistles, (laughs) I can't even say that right, Uh, is, is not so much their development, but what we do with it. Did you hear what I said? You're going to have misunderstandings. Who gives a rip? Get over it. Humble yourself. Go to your wife. Go to your spouse and say, baby, I'm sorry. I goofed up. I raised my voice. I'm sorry. Just go do it. What's the big whoop? Why the pride and the arrogance and the destruction of your home? The thing that should remind us the most of heaven. Like Christ in the church. How proud and arrogant can we be? And we waste away the grace of God and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who do we think we are? Stronger than Lucifer? Did I I make that clear? I'm I'm not sure I did. Carl, did I? Yeah. They twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no longer twain, but they are one. Uh, Go back to Proverbs. What does this look like? So when a man leaves his father and his mother and he cleaves to his wife, 
And they become one. What does this look like? Now, this is really, really beautiful. We're going to have to short circuit this. But I want to show you how a Christian home atmosphere should be. Let's go to verse 18. Did I say Proverbs 5, 5, 5, 5? Proverbs 5. Are you there one time? I know I should wait for you. Proverbs 5, verse 18. Here's what the Proverbs writer says about marriage. What he's doing is, I don't have enough time to explain... uh, the psychology and the theology that's in Proverbs chapter 5, the verses preceding. So we're going to break in right at 18, okay? Here we go. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her body satisfy thee at all times and be thou what? Does your Bible say? Ravished. In her love. Now let me ask you a question. Are you awake? Did I read this out of the Bible or out of the uh, Covington Herald? Did I read you God's Word? When it says, when it says that let your fountain, the word fountain there, if you look it up in the Hebrew, that means the passions and pleasures and activities of marriage. That which creates the home. It's the quality of the marriage relationship between father and mother that creates the whole atmosphere with our children. You have a bad man, you have a bad wife, you're going to have bad relationships, I'm sorry, you're going to have bad home atmosphere, and from that stigma, from that atmosphere, we're going to develop bad children. Is that easy or hard to understand? That's easy to understand. Come on, this is, this is second grade teaching. And so he's talking He's talking here about the passions and the pleasures and activities of marriage that create atmosphere in a home in which we're to bring up our children. You all got together and produced children, right? I see about a hundred of them in here. There's a lot of children in here, man. You got a lot of children. You guys got your work cut out, let me tell you one time. Get busy. Do it. They're going to spend eternity somewhere. You got your work cut out. So your children come from your marriage, but... You know, anybody can produce children. We're not talking about anybody anyway. We're talking about God designed passion and pleasure and activities between a husband and wife. Yes, it produces children, those arrows in our home that we send out. Blessed is the man that has his quiver full. But we're talking about the type of atmosphere in which we are going to raise these children that have never dying souls. Here's what he says about that atmosphere. He says, let your passions and sexuality be... Where are we? 18. Let them be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Do you rejoice in your marriage? Does your marriage bring pleasure and oneness? You just hate to leave home. Oh, man. Corey, you're leaving home. And you're going to hate it, aren't you? Now, he's going to, are you going to go preach? And you're going to preach the Word of God. You're going to preach with passion and fire the fire of the Lord. There's a sermon for you. The fire of God. But he's, not going, to like, he's going to miss his wife. He's not going to like that part of it. I guess you're not going along, are you, Dolores? Oh, she is this time. One time, good. Man. It's a little bit of a honeymoon type thing with the preaching. Eh? <laughs> That's what I do. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her be as those deer that are planning to make offspring. Let's go further. And let her, let her life, let her body satisfy you at all times. And be thou, stay with me, here's where we're going. I didn't make this up. Number two, this is not an option. A commandment is a commandment. Sometimes those of us who don't understand theology, those of us who live in a state of rebellion or unbelief, we sort of like, we take God's commandments and we try to barter with God like He's a big brother in order for me to get my own way. And we condescend upon God and His Word and His will. And we barter with God and we take His commandments and we make them optional. God's commandments are not optional. 
Don't make it optional. We make it optional because we don't, we're not the people that we should be. We're not the husbands and wives in Christ that we should be. And so we don't attain to God's high standards. And he helps us to attain. He provides all the equipment, all the nurture, all the inspiration in order for us to be the husbands and wives and fathers and mothers we should be. God supplies it. Heaven is full. Come on. But when we don't do that, then we begin to barter with God and we have the audacity called intestinal fortitude to question God at his own game and make a commandment an option. Isn't that crazy? Does God need that kind of help? When God says don't do it? When God says don't do it, what does he mean? Don't do it. When God says, do it, what does he mean, boys? Two words. Do it. Say that together. Here we go. Do it. So we're to leave. We're to cleave. This creates an atmosphere in which to bring up our children. And they grow up and they are secure. They love the father. They love the mother. They're their best friends. And when the issues of life come and they turn 13 and 14 and wonder what's going on, or they turn 17 and 18, want to think for themselves, you might feel like they think daddy lost some of his common sense, but it'll all come out in the wash when they're 22. Daddy will suddenly get a lot smarter than what he was a few years earlier. Don't worry. Just laugh and go biking together. But here's what I want. Let her satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. That means intoxicated. I need to be intoxicated. That means there is a power, there is a controlling power in my life that brings that, that, uh, that cleaving together, that oneness. I am supposed to cleave to that lovely young lady back there. Cleave to her! And so whenever I see other beautiful, there's other beautiful, lovely women in this audience. I didn't say loveliest. That's okay. They're not mine because I'm ravished. The love that I have for that lady sitting back there, it ravishes me. It's, it's an intoxication. It's, it's a peripheral power that comes into my life that all my life, my desires, my passions are focused they're streamlined right to her, and there's not another woman in my life. I am a man, a one wife, settled, slush, period. That doesn't mean that you don't have a nice wife. I see a lot of nice people here this morning. But they're not mine. And so I'm ravished. And she is ravished with my love. This creates atmosphere. It creates a place where children and teenagers want to be. They're going to duplicate what they feel at home, even subconsciously. Do you know what my wife and I see as a pastor? And I'm not very experienced, haven't been around very long, but yet we've been around the block. I want to be modest there. But I've noticed that Children, married children, unless they have overcome the idiosyncrasies and the sins of their parents, if they, don't, if they don't overcome and get a grip and get ahead of the dysfunctions and the idiosyncrasies in the marriage of their parents, they will duplicate in their own life, in their own marriage, the very thing they hated at home. Did you catch that? That's deep. We have dysfunctional young marriages. Husbands that don't take the responsibility to be ravished, to be intoxicated, to be controlled by the, the love of that marriage. Like the Holy Spirit controls us. When, I, when we get angry, I feel like revving that thing up and popping the clutch. You remember the old Z28s, Hearst four shifters back in the 1960s? You guys don't even know what a Hearst shifter is. Neither do you know what a carburetor is or a V8. Poor guys. Okay, so I'll come back over here. 
You know, there are times when, you know, we all have a bad day. We all get a little bit ruffled. Come on, do you? What do you feel like doing? Revving that thing up to about 6,000 RPM and popping the clutch and burning rubber. Ladies, you know what burning rubber means? No, you don't. <laughs> these, young, these cars of today anymore don't burn rubber. And so the Holy Spirit says, come on, you had a bad day. Somebody sideswiped you. You feel like burning rubber, but you're not going to. You're going to be kind and forgiving. That's intoxication. That's the power of the Holy Spirit saying, no, you don't act the way your carnal flesh wants to and act Christ-like. And so this, this is how it works in human sexuality. This is how it works in, in the love affair inside a marriage. We are to be ravished. Why am I making such a big issue about this? Because it's, this, it's, it's the quality of the relationship of the marriage that is the epitome, the foundation of everything that creates atmosphere in your home. If mother and father don't get along, the children aren't going to get along. If you're dysfunctional, your children will have a propensity to be dysfunctional because they will duplicate the very thing they hated about home. Did I make that clear? Okay. Ravished. <clears throat> Can I get a drink? <clears throat> Do you remember the Leuven brothers? You've got to be pretty old to remember them. Sang a song, something like this. <clears throat> Here's what home should look like. I think I can get the words. Walking down the street. Do you know this? While walking down the street one evening, I passed by a cottage so neat. I stopped, and I looked in the window, and I saw there a picture so sweet. A husband, his wife, and their baby. They were hugging and kissing too. And he turned aside his tears to hide. And from his lips came these words. What is home without a sweet wife to greet you each night at the door? What is home without a baby to love, to tease, and adore? What is home without sunshine to spread its bright rays from above? You may have wealth and its pleasure, but what is home without love? Do you have that? If you don't, that's not the worst thing. The worst thing would be is, if you don't have it, if we would be too dumb, too jealous, and too belligerent to go get it where it's freely given. Did you get that last statement? Can I go on? Colossians, please, beat it. Three, chapter. Three elements, no, not elements, three. Hmm. The three main players of a home. Verse 18, Colossians 3.18. Here are the three main players of a home. Of course, the fourth one would be God. And you all heard it said that marriage and home life, stay with me, and child training is like a triangle. Eh? So where's God in this? Up here. And we're down here somewhere in a triangle. And the closer we get to the creator of the emotions and the body and the needs and the passions of my spouse. 
the closer we are to God. So Colossians 3.18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, because this is a suitable thing. This is the correct, this is the doctrinal thing to do in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, lest they be discouraged. So what I would like to do now is I would like to very, very quickly, we have what, 10 minutes I'm going to look very quickly at these three players, and I would like to look at the privilege and the role of a husband. We had the husband, and it says, Husbands, we're to love our wives. We are not to be bitter. Now, let me ask you this question. Stay with me. Wake up one time. Why in the world would God have to tell us husbands not to be bitter against our wives? Crazy. When you were courting, when you were on your honeymoon, and, and the preacher said, now look, uh, you know, 10 years from now, or in three months from now, don't get bitter towards your wife. We thought, he ought to retire. <laughs> it might be true. But you know, we just have that propensity. Somehow, when we step out of our place, when we don't treat our wife like Jesus treated the church, and you're part of the church. Let me ask you, husbands, here this morning, how many times have we gone back on a relationship with Jesus Christ? How many times did we fail of the glory and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? So why didn't Jesus come down and bang, just smash us and throw us from his presence? Like David said in Psalm 51, God didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that to us, husbands. God did not get bitter against us. When we failed, when we became dysfunctional, when we made mistakes, God didn't wipe us off the map, swat us like a fly, say, get out of here, you smelly thing. Did he? So then this is how we're to be towards our wives. They're going to goof up. They're going to burn the eggs. They're going to back into your brain new suburban with the old rusted out old Jeep. You know, these things are going to happen, so What? But we, we, we can get bitter over things because the love and the passion is pretty thin. And then every little thing that goes wrong in the marriage becomes a big mountain of disgrace and contention. So husbands, we need to love our wives. Uh, so I'm going to... You know, we go to Ephesians. I'm going to skip this. We go into Ephesians, and there it says, Husbands, love your wives as what? Already said it. Christ loved the church. But now, let me show you something in Peter. Now, wives, you can hold your ears shut during this if you want to, because you're going to go home, hit your husband in the ribs, and say, See, I told you so. Listen to what the preacher said. It's right here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. So maybe you ought to hold your ears shut. Husbands, brace yourself up, bristle up a little bit, and be tough. We're going to get to the ladies in a minute. And here's what it says. So if we want to have a happy, romantic marriage, is there anybody here this morning, you, you want a happy, satisfying, romantic love relationship with your wife like Christ did the church? Hands up! Oh, man, I can keep preaching. How are you going to do it? How are you going to get it done? Is it working out for you? If you keep being the same type of husband that you are this morning, no growth, no confessions, if it's needed, are you going to arrive to the place where you put your hand up about? Look at this. This is quality. Are you in 1 Peter 3, 7? Likewise, you husbands, dwell with your wives. What? I want to hear you say it. According to... To knowledge, giving honor unto your wife as, uh, as unto the... What does your Bible say? It should say. That's King James, and I like King James. If you go into other languages and back in the Greek, a more accurate... Sorry to those who are King James only. I don't throw that out. I, I try and be flexible. But the weaker vessel could say, it's more accurately in the Greek to say, the more delicate one. 
So between a husband and a wife, which one is the most sensitive, has the greater part of the emotions, and is the most delicate? Which one? Do you think boys? The wife. Hey, you're well on your way to becoming a good husband. How old are you? Are you looking? <laughs> no. Question number two, where are you going to be sitting tonight? Not here. Not back there. I pick on the people on the front benches. Didn't you learn that yet, fellas? And so the wife is the more delicate one. And the Bible says, I didn't make this up. Are you with me? The Bible says that husbands, we need to dwell with them according to what? Because she's more delicate. She has needs. She has passions. She has feelings. And she has emotions. And so we are to live with all that thing that might seem so complicated with knowledge. Do any of you guys do any, any type of technical work? Any computer geeks in here? Any people that rebuild engines or rebuild automatic transmissions or, or build sheds? Uh, that looked very, very extremely complicated to me over there. Yeah, you know, Carl was showing us this and that, and Corey, and it's like... <laughs> wood, this type of trim on that, you know, whatever that is, and the softening and the trim and the undergirders. Do you know what an undergirder is? I don't either. And so there's a lot of things out there that are extremely, uh, technical is not the word I want, complicated. And if you think a computer, a laptop is complicated, young boys, a young lady is much more so. Now, the only reason, now listen, the only way that you're going to make a marriage work and explode in the dynamics of fruition and romance and heaven on earthness, I never said that word in all my ministry, earthness. Is that a word? It is now. Don't ask me how you do that in Spanish. Is that we are going to have to study. So I need to study my wife. I thought I knew a lot about my wife the day we got married. That was only the beginning. I wasn't even in kindergarten yet. <laughs> but you know what? The most pleasurable thing that I have done on this side of heaven, and I really can't know that for sure because I've never been to heaven and back, is the most pleasurable thing that I did is unpack and study the delicacies and the beauty and the feelings and the passions of my wife, and then be there to meet them like Christ did the church. Christ met our every need, right? Is there anything, is there anything from salvation that God didn't give us yet? Well, well, what is salvation lacking? Somebody, who's the smartest person in here? I believe it's our brother sitting back there. He looks like a man of wisdom. He had the devotions this morning. What, what, what lacks in salvation? I mean, God opened up heaven and cascaded. He poured out everything we need upon His bride. We're His bride. And so husbands, we have a physical bride, our wife. And when we study them, we're to study them. We're to live together with them in knowledge that we can meet their needs, their desires, their passion, not lord over them, not scold them, not get bitter against them. Why am I maximizing on this? Because... Let me say it again. The type of relationship that we have or don't have with our spouse sets the precedence of the atmosphere in which our children are going to grow up with and upon and in that atmosphere they will decide for God or against God. <laughs> Marriage relationship is critical. Because it's the Bruder house. It's the... Where did they put premature baby? The incubator of the eternity. Come up in chaos, confusion, fighting. Or I bring them up in, in a romantic, loving, forgiving atmosphere. Come on, get a grip. So, 
Abraham Lincoln said this, I got to quit. Okay, I have what? One minute yet? Do you have two minutes for me? Okay, I'm going to stop at 12. But I want to have a quick invitation. Abraham Lincoln said, All that I ever hoped to become, or all that I ever have accomplished, I must attribute that to my, who knows the last words? Come again. I didn't hear it. My angel mother. All that I ever hoped to become or accomplish, I must attribute that to my angel mother. I understand that. I have three angelic women in my life, and I better hasten to clarify that. One is my mother, one is my wife, and one is my daughter. My mother, now you can't take this real, I mean, biblically literal, but my, my mother was an angel. My wife is an angel. And I think my daughter is everything, men, our spouse, the importance of loving each other. We, did, we didn't get to the women, a woman, a model, a lady who models the perfume and the powder and the presence of Jesus Christ in her everyday life. A woman who smells like Jesus. Jesus. I know it sounded idealistic, and it's tough to get to where I said, the Bible said we can be and should be, but if you're here this morning and you're a husband or a wife and, and you know that you've gravely failed your children, you felt the Lord calling you, why, why wouldn't you make a public confession? Get up off that seat and humble yourself. Get over yourself. None of us are that great. If you think you're a big, tough, Anabaptist pillar, go home and look in the mirror. You'll find that you got buck teeth and greasy hair, and we're just not all that great. Our biodegraded bodies are worth about 37 cents in mulch. So get over yourself. If you're, <laughs> if you're here this morning and you failed your spouse, you failed your children, don't sit there and wrestle and act like you didn't. They know that you did. Just get up. If you're here as a teenager, you feel like you failed. The contribution that God wants you to have been in your home, come to your feet. I, get to your feet and just come forward. It, it's simple. This, this is childish stuff. We make Christian confession and repentance so complicated, so churchy. Oh, oh, I've been a church member here for 30 years. I don't do stuff like this. I don't care if it's a million years. If you're here and you're in marital defeat, or that's maybe too strong. If you come forward, everybody's going to think, oh, I'm in marital defeat. If, if there's a gnawing splinter under your fingernail, get to your feet. This doesn't mean that you're in fornication or adultery. It doesn't mean that you're in pornography. But if there's something, if you're just dissatisfied and you want to recommit as a spouse, as a child, get to your feet. Simple. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the beauty and the power and the simplicity of your word. You're so good. You're so wonderful. And Father, we fail. We come short. That's not the worst. But when we do nothing about it, when we pretend to be something we're not, we're hypocrites and you vomit. Lord, take charge of this childish, simple invitation. Help us to restore our marriages, our commitments. Set us free from guilt. Set us free from shame and from hypocrisy, Lord. Be with this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're going to have to come quick. We're going to sing maybe.